Good morning, everyone. When I first started my PhD 45 years ago, I thought I knew a lot about the subject that I was going to be researching. My first year of literature study on the subject soon put me to rights. I really knew very little about the subject in reality. There were many things that were linked to it that I had not considered. Things that clear, seemed clear at first sight, but really what was going on was what I thought I knew because of generalities that were used just to assist casual understanding. I didn't really understand, and it really showed me how little I knew. I felt that I was quite thick and stupid, and I really knew nothing, and that there was a subject, and this was a subject where I had studied and got an honours degree just a few years earlier. You may be thinking now, and you're still thick. And you are probably right, because knowledge is one thing, but wisdom is another. How to use that knowledge is what makes you look worthwhile, helps you. We all think that we are quite intelligent, but are we? Our Bible reading started with the question, who is wise and understanding among you? James wasn't looking for people to say how, they, how wise they were. He wanted to see it in their lives, the things that they did, the humility that they had in doing these things. What really showed their wisdom was how they conducted themselves. Tim spoke last week about the first part of this chapter and how we conduct ourselves in the church with particular reference to controlling our tongues. Our passage really flows on from the same ideas about how we conduct ourselves as a church. It is about the church being in harmony. We all like to have harmonious relationships. It just makes life that much easier, doesn't it? And far more comfortable. However, many Christian churches and homes are marked by frequent conflict. Sometimes we try and put a spiritual face on our side on our side of things and make it look as if we are trying to defend the truth or standing on a principle. There is certainly a place for defending the truth, as we all know. But there is a right way and a wrong way to contend for the truth. Paul's ministry is characterised by his defending of the faith. And he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24 to 26. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to, to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. He did not say, as many people today would have us believe, don't get into disputes about the truth because love is more important than doctrine. He did not say to correct those who are in opposition to the truth, but to do it with kindness 
and patience and gentleness. The churches James was writing to were experiencing conflict. We shall probably hear some more about that when T Tim speaks next week about chapter 4. In our reading, in verse 14, James says, But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts. The commentaries tell me that this indicates, because of the Greek clause that is used, that this was true of some of the church. James was therefore not addressing a hypothetical situation but one that was real in the church at the time. In the context, he began chapter 3. That was not... Sorry. In, in context, he began chapter 3, warning that not many should become teachers, because we will be judged and incur stricter judgment. Then he broadened it out in t to deal with the problem of the tongue and the evil and destructive tongue that, that it, it, it is. In our passage, James may still be focusing, at least in part, on those who will become teachers. As teachers, we must continually be on our guard not to boast about our knowledge and our wisdom, something that I alluded to in my open, opening remarks. You must be careful about being jealous of those who have bigger audiences. We must be wary of giving in to the wrong motives that serve our ambition and trying to attract our own following rather than bringing people to Christ. That is our main function as Christians. So our text really applies to us all. Those who teach from up here or in a home group or in men's breakfast or ladies' breakfast. But it also applies to each one of you in that James is showing that God's wisdom will lead to harmonious relationships in his church. He contrasts God's wisdom which leads to harmony with the worldly wisdom which leads to conflict. The things James is writing about in these six verses apply to harmonious relationships not only in the church but also in our homes and in our workplaces, and in our, all of our lives. James is really saying, for harmonious relationships, behave with godly wisdom, and not worldly wisdom. James in many ways sets a trap for his readers in verse 13, the first part, by saying, who is wise and understanding among you? There may, be, there may have been some who were thinking, I'm glad you recognise my talents. But then he springs his trap in, verse part, in part two of uh, the verse. Let them show their good deeds by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. We have to show our good deeds, our life, our trust in Christ through the things that we do. Those who thought they were good were so good had some work to do to rec be recognised as being wise. James challenges us to show our wisdom by the way we conduct ourselves. As Charles said at men's breakfast yesterday, we may be 
the only Jesus that people see. And if we don't show Jesus by the way we live and act and conduct ourselves, we won't be showing people who Jesus is. What a challenge that is. Our lives need to show gentleness of wisdom. Gentleness is often translated as meekness. It is one of the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, verse 5. And it is the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 23. In its original meaning, it did not suggest a meek, weak person who is always nice, but rather the idea of strength under control. It could be considered as a tamed horse, which is powerful, but submissive to its master. A meek person may be very strong, but is submissive to God's spirit. Look at Moses, who was described as the meekest man on earth in Numbers 11. Verse 29. Yet he was a strong leader of the nation of Israel in the wilderness. Jesus described himself. (coughs) (coughs) Jesus described himself as meek in Matthew 11, chapter 20. Sorry, Matthew 11, verse 29. And yet he powerfully confronted the religious leaders and drove out the money changers in the temple. James was acquainted with Torah or Old Testament. It was the Bible the Christians had and the Hebrew word for wisdom in it has the nuance of skill. Specifically, the kind of wisdom that the book of Proverbs exhorts us to seek is a skill to produce an attractive life in God's sight. James may have had his mind on Job 28, 28. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. True wisdom is based on knowledge, but it is more than knowledge. It is the ability to live in a manner pleasing to God because you understand his truth and you live in constant submission to his spirit. Applying that truth in all of your life. In verse 17 of our reading, James tells us that this wisdom comes from above, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. We need to recognise where this wisdom comes from, but also how it is recognised. Do our lives reflect this? Are we peace-loving, considerate, submissive? Not a very popular word today. Are we merciful? Do we show good fruit? And are we impartial? and sincere. Thank goodness we can come to God in confession. James also talks about worldly wisdom in verses 14 to 16 and lists the five marks of worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom is rooted in bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Worldly wisdom is arrogant. Worldly wisdom 
lies against the truth and worldly wisdom results in disorder and every evil thing. We need to recognise that peace must be cultivated with deliberate effort and attention. The English Standard Version translates verse 18 as and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The point is simple. You reap what you sow. If a farmer sows corn, he reaps corn, not oats or barley. If you sow peace, you will reap peace. If you sow selfishness and strife, you will reap conflict. This verse also tells us that the harvest is not accidental. No farmer sits around doing nothing all year and then goes out into the field and says, look, what a bountiful harvest. I must get my harvester out. If there is a harvest, it is in part because he has worked hard to cultivate that harvest. He has prepared the soil, distributed the seed, provided the fertiliser, watched the rain gently water it. If you see a church or a home where there is peace, it is because all the members have worked together to cultivate that peace. They have listened to one another, respected one another, judged their own selfishness and pride and sought to live in accordance with godly wisdom and not the wisdom of the world. As a church and as a community and as a town, we need to strive to do this. It won't be easy, but if we start to become a beacon for that peace, it will shine into those around us and if we work hard they too will become part of that beacon. One thing that I read oh, was when I was uh, preparing this and it might seem quite a strange thing was about the Guinness Book of Records. They decided to publish that book back in 1985 to settle arguments in a far more peaceful way than the traditional way, i.e. a barwoman ball. But in 19, by 1987, it had become not just, it had become the best-selling copyrighted book in publishing history. We have a book that has been a bestseller for far longer and that to help us to live harmoniously. The wisdom of God's word. But because of selfishness, pride and jealousy, some Christians have used the Bible to attack others and to justify themselves. James wants us to apply godly wisdom to our lives and to our relationships, both inside and outside of the church. To do this, we must build up our relationship with God through prayer and confession as individuals, to learn what God wants for us and to know and how we should live our lives. And I'll leave that thought with you. Amen.